The, uh, we're starting on John 3.12, and let's begin with a short prayer. Father, we pray your care and blessing on the people in the earthquake zones in, in Syria and Pakistan, and most particularly on the people who are aiding in the, uh, the recovery. And may uh, this be an opportunity for nations to work more closely together on something that serves all people. We ask this in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Okay, verse 12, John chapter 3. And remember, this is uh, Nicodemus' conversation with, uh, with uh, Jesus. And I should point out, it's probably constructed, structured that way in your uh, book. But uh, this is actually a poem that uh, if they have these things set a, apart, they usually do in a set form. But this is a, in poetry. Remember, uh, John's account is the last one produced, probably about 100 years, close to 100 years uh, after the birth of Jesus. So the, uh, the, what do you call it, the, um, the church had, you know, this is a developed text more than Mark, which appears to be almost a diary is what it's going on. So in 12, it says, if I have spoken about earthly things and you do not believe me, how will you believe when I speak to you about heavenly things? And Basically, what what the uh, what Jesus is saying to to Nicodemus here is uh, the, the fact of the matter is when when you speak of earthly things, you can verify them, okay? And if you speak of divine things, you can't. So you have to find someone truthful, and you find their truthfulness in the way they speak of things you can verify. And that, that's one of the things that, that we were taught in, um, in, in the seminary, that like if, if you go to, suppose you're gonna talk to a group of fifth graders. Well, you, you want to talk about some things that deal with what fifth graders know because they can verify that as being truthful, that he's, you know, he's talk, making sense there. And then you can go on to other things. And, and the same thing, and I'm sure you're just like me, that there, there's some fields I know a lot about and some I don't. And I'm, I, if I'm listening to a speaker on a subject I know nothing about, I pray to God he wanders into something I know at some point so I can tell if he knows what he's talking about, you know? Because in his area, I need to believe him, okay? So anyway, so this is what Jesus is saying. He says, if, if you can't believe me in the things about which you can, you know, uh, prove, uh, how do you expect to believe about heavenly things? He says, no one has ascended to heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Now. Another thing to notice is consistently in the scriptures, Jesus will attribute to himself the title Son of Man. You know, I, I think as uh, a Roman Catholic and our, our basic doctrine of the idea of Jesus being God, I wish he'd referred to himself as God, okay? But he doesn't. And Son of Man particularly you, when you pull it out of Ezekiel and you pull it out of what's called apocalyptic literature is a reference to God. And in, in Hebrew, there's no way Jesus could say, I'm God, because they don't have a word for God. God has a name. And so Jesus can't say, I'm Yahweh, because in our knowledge, Yahweh is the Father, okay? And so he couldn't say, I'm God. There's, there's no word for God. And uh, so anyway, this is the term he uses. And this idea of ascended into heaven, he says that he is the only one who actually has experiential knowledge of heaven. And so he, he has the right 
and the ability to speak about heaven like no other person. And it's because he has this uh, experiential knowledge. He says, as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so must the Son of Man be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. If, if you go to, um, I think two of the synoptics, I don't think it's in all three, but I think in Matthew and Luke, um, three times in the account, Jesus will tell the apostles that he's going to die and that he's going to be crucified and that he tells them that he will be raised. So sometimes he, he says just about the death, sometimes he says, I, I don't know if he says crucified, he says sometimes he says he, he will be killed, they will kill the Son of Man, and then sometimes he says they'll kill the Son of Man and be raised. But appears three times in, I think, Matthew and Luke. It never appears in John. Whenever John does it, he does this thing about the lifting up of the uh, snake in the desert. And the reason he does that is because this term lifted up has a double meaning. The term lifted up can mean to be impaled. Basically, they would use that for the cross as well. It can mean something like that. But it's exactly the same word you'd use to be promoted. So like if you happen to be prince and became king, they would use exactly the same word. And for John, the glorification of Jesus is completely interwoven with the passion, okay? Like, like as I would look at the passion being a downhill run, and I would look at the resurrection to the ascension, an uphill run. I see that, you know, but that's not the way John does. John sees the passion of Jesus interwoven so that while in a sense, the body is going under, the divinity is more and more realized. And that's why, like, I, I think you remember that one of the things that will happen is as soon as Jesus dies on the cross, one of the centurions will say, truly this was the Son of God. Another one's gonna say, truly this was an innocent man. And then suddenly, Joseph of Arimathea comes forward, who was hit. Why did all these people, come? you know, you'd think once he's dead, then that'd be the last time you should come forward, particularly if you were afraid to come forward when he was alive. Why would you come forward when he's dead? And what John's getting at is, you are watching what in the eyes of a human being is a descent into, but in the eyes of God is the ascent to glory. It is exactly the same thing. And I, I think one of the things that, that is a, uh, almost a truism of being a human being is that in your life you will notice at times that things that you go through experientially seem to be a very serious problem or really thing and then ultimately you end up benefiting and you realize the process you went through was a wonderful thing and and I've shared with you a number of times, like in my own background, that probably the heaviest thing I ever carried was going through grade school with dyslexia, where um, basically they thought I was retarded. They didn't know anything about dyslexia or anything like that. And so I went through school kind of with that burden in school. My parents never let me think that way because of the way I was treated at home. But the, I went through school with that burden and then when I got through the whole thing, the effects of it, like number one, is I can't really use notes. So it causes me to be better prepared mentally because I can't you know, read the notes. And because I can't read notes, I can't give long homilies. And you end up finding out that that's a benefit, you know? <laughs> but I'll tell you, the first five, no, the first three pastors under which I served, the consistent, uh, correction, and they even send it to the bishop. He does not preach long enough. They would send it. And when the bishop asked me about it one time, I said, have you ever heard that from a Catholic in a pew? He said, no, that was, that was the end of it. Yeah. So, but the, the, the idea is 
that I thought it was a terrible burden and everything, but it wasn't. It's what prepared me to be what ultimately I wanted to be anyway. So, but I, I, this is one of the basic themes of John, that part of a human life is that you and I very easily misread the present, okay? Over a period of time it can come to be, and I, 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 when I do the Stations of the Cross, I always mention that with uh, Simon, you know, Simon carrying the cross. I bet he thought of a thousand other places he should have been or if he'd left work earlier or later or anything. But when you read him in heaven, the first thing he's gonna tell you is, I am the man who carried the cross of Jesus Christ. The fact of the matter is it's the most important moment of his entire life, you know? And I think that happens with lots of people. So anyway, so um, he says that, uh, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. And this is another thing of John, that while John recognizes, you know, this thing going on in Jesus, that he, he uses the, uh, I'll, I'll give you my phrase for it, he is focused on the for us. So, you know, it, it, it's like, uh, and then he dies on the cross, and you know, everyone looks sympathetically, but John says, what's that got to do with us? He says, well, that saves us. Everything that, and I, on the creed, you know, the, if, if you listen to each of the consecrations, the consecration of the bread and the consecration of the wine, in each of the consecrations, you'll find the phrase for you. Who for you, for your salvation, you know, this sort of thing. If you go through the um, creed, the, it, when the creeds were written, they were, you know, they used to, murders in the streets and everything, they fought over the words terribly and the creeds are very tight in the listing of doctrine and everything. There's only one thing that appears in the creed and it appears three times. For us, for our salvation, he died for us. And it, it's this whole thing that the most important truth in our faith is the for me. That is the most important truth. So that we ask God, why did you create the whole universe? He said, for you. He asked God the Son, why would you ever go through such a horrible death and everything? The answer, for you. And why would the Spirit empower us and build the world he does in the church? For you. The, the God is for us. So he says, so that everyone who believes in him may find eternal life. And then he says, for God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. And uh, I, I'd like you to notice, I, I've oftentimes mentioned to you that Hebrew has a very small vocabulary. And because of that, many words do double duty. But if you read a text, you kind of know what's talking about. Um, very often in the teachings of Jesus, you'll find out you must hate the world. You must be away from the world. You must leave the world. You know, you must, this sort of thing. And then it's speaking of God the Father, he so loved the world. And when God the Father, when we're told that he so loved the world, understand, first of all, that they're talking about the world as a cosmos and as people. And when he talks about move away from the world, he's talking about worldliness. He's not talking about the cosmos, okay? The other thing to note here is that anyone who would ever put a divide between the Jewish scriptures and the Christian scriptures and somehow see the Christian scriptures as God all lovey-dovey and in the Hebrew scriptures that God's this, this uh, mean character have got to look at this text where it says that God so loved the world that he sent Jesus, you know? That it is the love of God the Father that, uh, that brought this about. And it, there's, uh, there's a lot of interesting ways of looking at it, and I have no idea where I got it, but I'll tell you the kind of the way I look at it. I look at it that God created the universe, God the Father, created the universe as a gift for Jesus Christ, that he ultimately was to rule this universe. And so it was a gift that God the Father created for Jesus. And that gift 
was messed up in sin. And the sin of Adam and Eve messed that, that gift up. And there are two things that could be done. One thing would be to replace it, you know, get a new universe, start over, okay? And, but the other thing is that Jesus, out of love for the Father, would go into it and correct it himself, which is what he did. And if you see that, you realize that creation is the Father's love of Jesus and salvation is Jesus' love of the Father. And I believe that's kind of the way it worked. But the problem is that once Jesus became a human being, human beings are endearing, particularly if you're a human being. I can't imagine we look like much from God's point of view. But if you're a human being, you get involved with human beings. And uh, you can look at your closest, dearest friend, you'll find out they aren't perfect. There aren't any perfect human beings. So, but this, this endearing quality, and I believe that's what happened with Jesus. Once Jesus was among us, he fell in love with the community he had. And, and that's, that's, we are the beneficiaries of all of that. And then he goes on to say, for God sent his son into the world, not to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Jesus is gonna emphasize this several times. And I, I think it's really, it, it's really curious the, um, this, this concept of law and judgment are so strong in the Christian community, it's terrifying. And you look at the, the thing of Paul, the whole thing is to get away from the law and look at the spirit. You look at the teaching of Jesus and the Beatitudes, the whole thing is to get away from prohibitions and into mandates, what we call people to do. And this, this endless thing, Jesus, here he says, he sent his son not to judge the world. And Jesus will tell us later on in the same gospel, I did not come to judge. And, and this, this whole thing, you know, when I, I, I see this, you know, that the Jesus will say, I did not come to judge. And then someone asks the Pope about homosexuality, and he says, who am I to judge? And he says, it's condemned. How could he have said anything more Jesus? And yet he's condemned. You know, it's, just, it's just bizarre. But for somehow, in religion, we love to judge people and point out whether they're wrong. It's a horrible quality in religious people. Okay? But anyway, Jesus, you know, he says, I, I did not come to judge, you know. And it, it would be very difficult for Jesus to live in the community of people if he's called to judge them, you know. I think he, you, you know that like, like in a marriage or something, the very first thing you need to abandon or don't get married is the idea of judging a person. If you, if you hold judgment, um, skip it, you know have an affair, go home, you know, but don't get married. The, the, this thing of the, the judgment is just, just, just deadly to the thing. And, and Jesus gave that up when he came among us. I, my, one of my favorite uh, writings is a letter Benjamin Franklin sent to a nephew of his who was getting married. I think you know, Benjamin Franklin was our ambassador to France so he was living in Paris and wrote this letter to his nephew in the States. And his nephew was about to get married. And Franklin said, look very carefully at the situation. Look very carefully at the woman. He goes through four paragraphs of how intensely he's supposed to examine this whole situation. And then the last line he says, and when you get married, close one eye for the rest of your life. Okay, so I said, if you're going to do the, all this judgment thing, do it beforehand. Once you're married, you can't do that. Okay, so anyway, so and so Jesus came here and he came to save us, uh, not to judge us. And I oftentimes think of this in terms of a doctor. You know, it must be very difficult for a doctor to deal with people who are in self-destructive patterns. You know. I, I can imagine being a doctor whose job it is to treat someone who has emphysema, 
who continues to smoke. But you know, a doctor won't decide not to treat them. That's not, you know, again, his thing is to save them, not to judge them. Hopefully he's telling them this, right, but it does not judge them. And, and I th think that's what we need to do in the, as, as believers. We need to be about the salvation of people and certainly want to see people lead better lives. And we need to be, lead better lives ourselves. But in the, in the process, be helping them, not judging to really avoid. And if you can't get over judging someone in a certain situation, you shouldn't be in that situation. That, that, that's true. I think, uh, you know, as, as a priest, I can tell you there, there are certain things that are so obnoxious to me that I have great trouble dealing with them. And one of them is people who abuse a person or an animal who they have in their care so that the very one who's supposed to be caring for them is, I simply can't deal with that. And I send those people to other people. I don't, I just can't deal with it. I'd be, I, I'm just too judgmental in that. He says, one who believes in him will not be judged. And you notice it doesn't say one who's perfect, one who keeps everything he says. It says one who believes in him will not be judged. He says, Whoever does not believe is judged already. And it's the thing is that I can come to Jesus for salvation, but I can't come to Jesus and find condemnation. The condemnation is that I don't come to Jesus. But if I come to Jesus, the only thing that's happening is, uh, what do you call it, salvation. Now I want you to know it's very important when Paul writes his... Uh, epistles, that Paul will be very, very clear about what saves people is faith. Salvation is based on faith. It's faith that saves us. And I'd like you to know that religion is the clothing that faith wears. So that if you would go into, let's say, Mother Teresa and go into, uh, let's say, Gandhi, you go into Gandhi and Mother Teresa, you'll find very different clothing. You'll find the Catholic clothing on Mother Teresa and the Hindu clothing on Gandhi, but they both clothe the same faith. The way they were concerned about people, the sacrifices they took for people and this, it is the same faith. And faith is salvation. So we need to be very careful about equating salvation with the clothing. Salvation is equated with the faith. And you and I can tell what religion different people are practicing, but none of us know the faith angle. We just don't know that. But anyone who believes in God will find salvation. Salvation isn't based on perfection, which we're incapable of anyway. Salvation is based on this faith relationship with God. So we enter this relationship. He says, uh, and the judgment is this, that the light has come into the world and people have loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. And this is another thing that um, John will sort of develop several times, this light darkness theme. But the, uh, the idea is that um, if, if I want to do something evil, I try and do it in secret. We don't do it in public. But to seek the darkness is to seek to be away from God. You know that when, um, when you study, uh, uh, like for instance, pornography, what, what is the, the thing that makes pornography work? Well, the first thing it has to do is be secret, okay? Like in, in my day, uh, pornography was in magazines, in stores, and you never bought one in your own neighborhood, okay? No one would touch that stuff where anyone they knew might see them. It has to be anonymous, okay? And that's why the internet has been so horrible to the whole business of pornography. But the, the people seek when they do what they know is wrong 
they seek to do it in such a way that no one sees it. Unless, of course, you're a certain member of the House of Representatives, but we won't go there. And uh, the, this idea that we, we really try and, and keep this sort of stuff secret, but to keep it secret is to keep ourselves away from God. And I, I think probably kind of where we can see this, or let's say where I see it in, a, in an area that has nothing to do with evil, that has to do with medicine, where uh, someone has, has something. I, I know uh, a, a woman, I knew a woman, she's deceased. I knew a woman in um, <clears throat> the uh, Spreckles area who uh, had a, uh, uh, a lump on her breast and uh, it turned out to be cancerous and it was removed and she went through the recovery and all this sort of thing. And uh, about nine years later, she had another lump on her breast. She would not go to the doctor. They wouldn't talk about it at all because she didn't want to find out it was cancerous. And it ultimately is what killed her. And the thing is, you know, you, you have to be open about these things. So if they're bad, maybe there's something they can do about them. Well, the same thing is morality. That, and that's why in, that's the, the very value of confession, the Roman Catholic Church, is that you're, you're, you say this to someone and they can let you know that, you know, probably a third of my time in confession is telling people something they've confessed is not a sin. You know, that after we had, uh, when we were, uh, what do you call it, uh, freed from the obligation for Sunday Mass during the COVID thing, people would consistently come to confession and confess they had missed Sunday Mass. And I would mention to them that, um, you know you're not obliged to me. I know, but I feel bad missing Sunday Mass. Like, I'm sorry you feel bad, but don't confess it as a sin, you know? And th this idea of we're supposed to find out that in the the process to be open in reconciliation, because oftentimes things that people are really worried about are not in fact sins, you know? That, and the other thing about a sin is you can't sin without knowing it. You know, that if you, like we had a professor in the seminary who told us that um, you should do a short examination of the conscience each evening, but he says, don't take a long time to do it before you go into confession. And one of the reasons is, if it's that serious, you'll remember it. If you don't remember it, it's probably not that serious, you know? So he says, you know, to, to have some, some sense of this. But the idea is, if I'm doing evil, I stay out of the light. And to stay out of the light, remember, Jesus Christ is the light. So to stay out of the light is to stay away from Christ. He says, indeed, Everyone who does wrong hates the light and does not come into the light so that such, such actions may not be examined. But whoever does, the truth comes to light so that it may be clearly seen that this person's works have been done in God. So the person who seeks the light is the person who's living a good life. The person who seeks the darkness is the one who's living in sin. But the way it really works is most of us live the good part of our life in public and the bad part of our life we try and keep hidden. That's, that's just the nature of being a human being. Unless I've just embarrassed myself and I'm the only one who does that. But anyway, it says, um, <clears throat> after this, Jesus and his disciples went to the Judean countryside and he spent more time there with them and baptized, okay? So Jesus spent more time there and he also baptized. We're gonna find out when the scriptures go on later that Jesus never baptized. And the reason that Jesus never baptized is because until the ascension into heaven, baptism as it's administered is John's baptism, which is the reconciliation. 
And so the apostles would do that, but Jesus never did, okay? And because baptism is something separate, we believe in the Catholic faith, there's a sacramental structure. And a sacrament embodies a moment of Jesus' life. And the sacrament, what the sacrament of baptism embodies is where Jesus says, come follow me. That is the call, okay? And what the sacrament of confirmation embodies is where Jesus sent the apostles out two by two so that we consider one a sacrament of discipleship, baptism, and one a sacrament of apostleship, which is confirmation, okay? And then you, you could go through the other sacraments. But anyway, the, uh, the thing is that Jesus didn't baptize. John also was baptizing at Anon near Salim because there was plenty of water there and people were going there and being baptized for John had not yet been thrown into prison, okay? Now a discussion arose between John's disciples and a Jew about purification. So they went to John and said, Rabbi, the man who was with you on the far side of the Jordan to whom you gave witness is baptizing and everyone is going to him. So what, what someone comes up to John, a follower of John, and says, you know, the guy you baptized has now gone over to this place and he's baptizing and more people are going to him than they are to you. And John replied, no one, no one can receive anything except it is given from heaven. And what, what he's talking about is the, this rite of baptism. Um, when you come forward to John for baptism, you receive forgiveness, but John can't forgive sins. It comes from God. And if this other guy's doing baptism and people are being forgiven, it comes from God, okay? It isn't from the other guy anyway, okay? Only God forgives sin. Uh, one of the things that I, I think of whenever I do this is a famous Presbyterian story. That I think I told you, my, my family came to Canada as Presbyterian missionaries to the Native Americans. And eventually at a certain point, uh, uh, my great-grandmother converted. But anyway, um, this Presbyterian story is when, when Presbyterians uh, choose a pastor, they have a wonderful system, I think, but um, they put a man in charge of the parish who will not be the pastor, and he's in charge for one year. And while he's in charge, anyone who would like to be pastor, like, say, at the mission, would simply apply to him, and he'd be invited one Sunday to give a homily. And then after the year, they ask the congregation to vote on who they want. And then, you know, that person comes. So anyway, the story is the, uh, this uh, guy is uh, a pastor. He's been there a long time. He's uh, really a famous preacher, and everyone's listening to him and everything. And a young guy comes in and opens another church, uh, another Presbyterian church. Now, and he's, you know, young, vibrant, fiery, and everything. So gradually the congregation is dissipating over to the other man. And so someone comes back and tells him, you know, the people are leaving and going over to listen to, what's his name over there? And so the next Sunday, the older pastor, when he got up, had all his congregation get up and he took them over to the other church. And once the service was over, he announced to his people, God has sent me, not necessarily to preach the word of God to you, but to make sure you hear the word of God. If you hear it better here, we'll all come here. Pure and simple, you know, this idea of not to see any kind of competition in any sense at all. So, he says, you yourself can bear witness that I said I'm not the Messiah, but I am the one who's been sent ahead of him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, and yet the bridegroom's friend, who stands and listens to him, is filled with joy at the bridegroom's voice. 
Now, in the, the uh, what do you call it, the Jewish tradition, uh, and particularly historically, uh, the Jewish position, the bridegroom, the, what do you call it, the uh, bridegroom's friend, we'll call him the best man. The best man has a very, very significant role. Uh, I think I told you there's a long period of time between the announcement of the wedding and the thing, and he's part of the preparation of making sure everyone finds out who's gonna be there. I mean, he has a much bigger job than playing jokes on the groom. So there's a, there's a whole process that goes on and, and he goes through all of this. But in spite of the whole process, at the end of the thing, if the best man ends up with the bride, something's wrong in the whole process, okay? And this is what John's saying. He says, I am the best man. I'm to prepare all of this and everything. But Israel is the bride of God. So when everything's finished, it's the Messiah who should not end up with Israel, not me. He's just, he's just very, very clear about this, okay? And he says, this joy of mine is complete. He says, I, I've done my job well. You know, if, you, if you're the best man and the car is going off, the bride and groom are there off on their honeymoon or the reception or whatever, your job's done and well, okay? So he says, he must grow greater, I must grow less. He who comes from above is above all, and he who is of earth belongs to the earth and speaks of the earth. So he, he's comparing the ministry of Jesus, which is a ministry of the supernatural, to his own, which is a ministry of the natural. And again, the natural involves sin and forgiveness. That's John's forte. And Jesus involves a call and glory. Okay? He says, he who comes from heaven bears witness to the things he has seen and heard, which is exactly what Jesus said earlier to Nicodemus. Okay? But no one accepts his witness, yet anyone who does accept the witness has confirmed that God is true, since he whom God has sent speaks the word of God. And what John's, what the author's getting at here is that to believe Jesus is an act of faith in God the Father because Jesus has been sent by the Father. So to the degree I believe Jesus, I'm manifesting this faith in God or faith in the Father. He says, uh, for God gives the Spirit without reserve. The Father loves the Son and has given everything into his hands. So that um, one of the, I think I told you that one of the signs of the Messianic age, and John mentions this, was the spirit rested on Jesus, rather than in the tradition, Jewish tradition, spirit comes and goes, and the spirit rested on John. And this idea, the Father gives the spirit without reserve, well, we believe in our tradition is that the amount of God's spirit that I receive is determined by me. God has absolutely no limits on the spirit he will give me. But you might think of it in terms of a sponge. It's the amount of water I'm willing to squeeze out of my life that creates the room for the spirit and the water being uh, sin. Okay, so the amount of sin I'm able to push out of my life creates the room for the spirit. And also in our tradition, the spirit is, uh, is, is an ongoing flow. And it's, I really like to compare it. I don't know if you've ever been to the hospital and got one of those machines that are supposed to clear your lungs of phlegm. But uh, they're, uh, I think you know you, you inhale this uh, gas, I don't know what it is, and it loosens a phlegm and you, uh, you cough it up for a few minutes and then you go in again. But what happens is when you've coughed up the, some of the phlegm, you've created more room for the gas. So the gas fills more room and then more of the phlegm comes out. And this is an ongoing process and that's the ongoing 
process of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes in my life, dumps some of the garbage, makes a bigger room, the Spirit comes back, dumps more of the garbage. And this should be an ongoing process in every human life, okay? And the one thing where this sometimes becomes a mistake is that oftentimes people, as they begin to grow, it becomes kind of a depressing thing because they look back on what they were and they judge it from where they are. And that's not proper, okay, that's not proper. You, in, in grace, you are today, not the person you were yesterday. You are not that person. And the, this ongoing process, allow the fact that you're growing to be something that is, is to be, you know, rejoiced about and not something to be, oh, I wish I hadn't, you know, I wish I could live it all over in a baloney, okay? It's just, we go through this, this, this ongoing process. He says, <clears throat> um, if finally the Father loves the Son and has given everything into his hands. Now everything has been given into the hands of the Son and the Son will not judge, okay? Think of it, everything has been put in the hands of the Son, and the Son himself will not judge. Both those were in this text, okay? Then he goes on, anyone who believes in the Son has eternal life. Now we saw that earlier. It's belief, not correctness, not absolute fidelity to the law, because this fidelity to listening to God is something that grows in our lives. And just like the Jewish community, we begin our life in a life of laws and prohibitions. Don't do this, don't do that, don't do the other thing. But we need to grow out of that. And one of the, one of the great problems in hearing the sacrament of reconciliation is that we tend to grow out of what I would call discernible sins. And you reach a point where what's wrong with my life is what I'm leaving undone not what I have done. Many Catholics become stalled at that point because they don't know how to go to confession. They, they're used to, you know, I was distracted at my prayers, I, I hit my little sister, I, you know, whatever. And you go through this, this thing and you, you reach a point where there, there aren't these things. And, and I cannot tell you the number of older people who come into confession to me and say, we know I'm, I, I'm really old and I can't sin anymore, so I think, I don't know what to say, you know? Congratulations. Anyway, the, uh, so, but, but this idea, we, we need to realize that we pass out of this, this thing of, uh, uh, out of, out of the, the thing of positive sin into the fact of sins being neglect. So that um, it, it would be, you know, you'd reach the end of the, let's say, uh, let's just go back as a youngster. If I reached the end of the day and didn't have a fight with my sister, I would consider that day a triumph, okay? And I'm sure the same thing on her side, okay? But, um, it never would occur to me if I came to the end of the day and didn't have a fight with my sister, it never would occur to me to ask myself, did I do something nice for her? Who does something nice for their sister? I mean, that just would not have occurred to me, okay? But th that, that's the way it is, you know? That, that when we get away from this, and we'll never be completely away from falling into these things, but the thing is, uh, the focus of our life is the, the undone good. The focus of our life at the beginning is the perpetrated evil. And then as we grow, the purpose of our life becomes the undone good, okay? And that we, we go on. He says, <clears throat> but anyone who refuses to believe in the Son will never see life, but is under God's wrath, okay? And the idea, you have to come to the Son of God because the Son of God is the one who cannot judge and will not judge. And that's why we want to go to the Son, okay? And um, I, I remember uh, one of the, uh, a sermon one time where what, the, what was said 
was that um, uh, the, the, the the two extremes that we find in the world are people who are so enmeshed in sin they expect to be damned and they're afraid of judgment. And there are people who are so self-righteous they don't think they should ever come before God for judgment. And there, there are these two groups of people as being the extremes. And what uh, the uh, this preacher was saying is that the only place you find justification is in the judgment of God. So, because you can't be justified on your own. So when you come before God the Father, he will justify you by his judgment. His judgment will justify you. But there are two groups of people who will not come before him. Those who are so enmeshed in sin, they're terrified of judgment. And those who think they're so perfect, they don't need judgment. And he says, hell is defined as the place where, who are, where people who are too good for judgment are forced to live with the people who are too sinful to face judgment. When those people live together, that's hell. That just is hell itself, okay? But this idea of uh, we, we come before God and as a, as a believer, you and I should come before God with absolute confidence and enter into judgment because it's his judgment that will justify us, okay? Based on the grace of Jesus Christ. Okay, I'm going to borrow someone's. Well, yours is just a pencil. It all seems more permanent as the pen. This is uh, chapter 4, verse 1. And we'll see if anyone has a question.